Good evening, everyone, or if you're joining from other parts of the globe, good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the Data Science and AI in 2020's Why Do It and What's In It For You session. Tonight's presentation will be delivered to you by Paul Cunningham. Paul is the CEO and founder of Core Intelligence Technologies and the Director of Data Science and AI Association Australia. In this session, Paul will talk about a new field called Applied Machine Learning. He'll explain what it is and how applied machine learning can be set up and applied within your organisation. If you do have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A box, which is located at the top right hand corner. And Paul will answer any questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul, who will start with your session tonight. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Nadia. Um, yeah, so I uh, much appreciate the introduction there, Nadia. Um, just uh, so the, tonight's presentation is called uh, Data Science and AI Applied Machine Learning. Why do it and what's in it for you? And uh, specifically, we're going to be focusing on the field of machine learning, which has essentially emerged in the last essentially two and a half years called that's uh, called applied machine learning and sort of explain what that is. But before we get into that, I just would like to say a little bit about myself and my history with machine learning um, and then and then go from there. So um, if you would like to uh, reach reach me, you can find me on Twitter uh, at that address. I like to, to tweet about all things machine learning, uh, kind of a little a little bit of uh, COVID-19 stuff at the, at the moment, but uh, for the most part, uh, I, I'm really focused on machine learning. Um, uh, also, sort of to backtrack a little bit, I've been doing machine learning since 2009. Uh, I, I, I was trained as an electrical engineer, and for my honors thesis, I did uh, neural networks and, and focusing on the field of reinforcement learning, and then um, continued to do uh, machine learning and data science ever since. Uh, I essentially finished up my career as a senior data science scientist at Woolworths, where I was building the, the recommendation engine for for uh, for Big W, um, and then graduated on from there to start my own company, along with all these other things, which I'll just show you quickly now. So uh, I, I also run uh, Sydney Machine Learning, which is the largest machine learning focused meetup here in Sydney. Uh, we uh, just went over the 5,000 user uh, attendee mark in uh, December. Uh, and back in 2018, we were lucky enough to run a deep re a star AI, which was a deep reinforcement learning course at uh, at the reactor, just, uh, just when it was created actually. And that was the first of its kind reinforcement learning course here in Australia. Um, something else, some other things I do is I run the Humans of AI podcast. Um, an episode of which will be coming out tomorrow, uh, specifically focusing on the field of ML ops, which is another field of machine learning. And last but not least, I uh, involved in the Data Science and AI Association of Australia, member on the board there. But as I mentioned, um, I, I, I'm now heavily involved in my company, Core Intelligence. Uh, feel free to check it out in that, at that link via, via when this presentation is on or um, at home when you get some time. All right, so as mentioned before, uh, Tonight's presentation is going to be focusing on the on the on the on the area of uh, applied machine learning and what that actually means. But, uh, but before we get to that, we sort of need to set the stage a little bit with a few with a few things. Um, for the data scientists or people, the se the, the more senior people in the audience, uh, a lot of this stuff might seem high level for you. Uh, I advise you though to stick around because there is still value to kind of see where. The field is going and sort of where what what applied machine learning actually means and how that'll apply to you in the coming years too and then hopefully um, for everybody else some of the stuff might also seem trivial but i uh, i really would hope that you sort of grasp these ideas because we're all sort of um building towards we, we're building ideas here laying layering them on like like a cake building up the cake and hopefully it'll all make sense at the end right so the problem uh the main problem with uh, uh, data science, AI and machine learning essentially in the last 10 years, but specifically the last five is essentially hype. So there's been um, a lot of hype in, in, in this space. Um, and and but that's not to say that it's been unwarranted. So whilst there's been a lot of hype, uh, there's also been a significant amount of breakthroughs uh, in the last specific like around the, in the last 10 years. 
Um, but it's important to set the stage uh, in the talk right now to, to say specifically what AI is and what AI is not. Okay, so to paint the picture here, uh, this is this is sort of a uh, machine learning around uh, 2015. Uh, this was grabbed of Google Trends, and uh, you can see that like uh, you know uh, machine learning was being sort of searched for, but it really started to explode around uh, 2016, and we've seen like maxing out 100% here. Uh, you know interest in machine learning. Um, but yeah, so in 2020, uh, AI is nowhere near human capability. So what does that mean? Um, that means that like uh, AI, uh, data science and machine learning does not, does like nowhere near have, like possess the common sense reasoning that you and I take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. So to, to kind of demonstrate uh, where AI is at and what this sort of statement means, I'm gonna take you through an example um, of a cutting edge machine learning system. Um, and you'll see why it sort of kind of makes sense in a bit. So for those of you who have seen this example before, bear with me because there's sort of an addendum to it. I've, I've given this, I presented this in a few talks in the past. But essentially uh, in 2014 and 2015, a company called DeepMind released the state of the art uh, machine learning algorithm that shocked the, 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 the machine learning community at the time. And the reason why it was such a great achievement was uh, so they created an algorithm to play not just this game, but it could play a whole host of different uh, Atari 2600 games from the 80s. And the example I'm going to show you here, this is the game of Breakout. So the, the objective is uh, to, the objective with Breakout is to sort of move the pedal around. You bounce the ball and hit these tiles um, or bricks. When you, when you hit a brick, it sort of, it gives you score. Uh, and now, okay, okay, so the reason that this was such a big breakthrough uh, in the machine learning field was just like you and I would play this game um, with raw visual output from the screen, the pixels, all the algorithm, all the algorithm was given was the, the pure pixels from the screen. So these pixels you're seeing right here uh, and access to the score and the ability to control the pedal left and right. So pedal left and right, access to the score and just the raw pixels. And from this information, the state of the art machine learning algorithm was able to learn how to play the game of breakout. So I'll just quickly walk you through that. Um, if you've seen this before, that's okay. Uh, so you can see right here that the, the algorithm isn't very intelligent. It's kind of playing how a computer would. Um, it's missing the ball. After 200 episodes, what that means is after 200 like attempts of, pl of playing the game, 200 rounds of playing the game, um, you can see that the, that it's starting to get like. Uh, Kind of intelligence, it's following the, the trajectory of the ball, it's learning to match it, but it's still a, a little bit janky. After the 400 like uh, games of, of, of uh, breakout, it's starting to play it a bit like a human would with like match, matching the trajectory and stuff. But the, the real magic happens around uh, the 600 episode mark. So here is where the, the algorithm learns to play the, the game the best way. It finds that the best strategy for, for playing the game. So it does this all by itself, just from the raw pixels. And uh, it does this by, if you've played this yourself, <laughs> if you've played Breakout this yourself, um, you would have potentially discovered the strategy where you make a tunnel on uh, either like the left or the right hand side, and then the ball just bounces around the top uh, and maximizes the score. So. This, this algorithm was able to determine and figure this out all by itself. And this like, uh, in 2014, 15, this like, so this shocked the, the AI community. Uh, but just to continue our story, uh, so uh, about two years later, uh, another company called uh, Vicarious, I believe is what their name is, did um, sort of a follow-up study on the same algorithm. Uh, and what they did is they did, they just modified the environment just slightly. So what they did here is they added a wall they added like a wall here. And you can see it's kind of at the point of the game where it's like bounce the ball around the top to, to maximize the score. But uh, you could kind of see that uh, they've added a wall and both uh, you and I as humans would be able to easily solve this problem because like you we just bounce the ball here and then hit, hit the, the bricks to get score, bounce the ball here, hit, some, hit the bricks. But the, the algorithm wasn't able to like, use common sense and figure that out, it, it broke it. And, and another use case here, they um, they moved the pedal up by a couple of pixels 
Uh, so again, the, the panel is usually at the bottom, where roughly where the, the YouTube bar is. And and again, uh, the the algorithm didn't wasn't able to figure out how to how to play the game. Now it completely broke it. So again, whilst this whilst this might uh, you know we're talking about games here, and you might might be saying, hey Paul, how does this apply to the real world? Well, like imagine if you use the same algorithm, which is state of the art, to control say a robotic arm that was like moving apples uh, into boxes or something, and then like a technician walks past and bumps the robotic arm therefore moving it like slightly out of its environment. You can quickly realize that like this algorithm is actually quite fragile and, and breaks. It, it, it wouldn't be able to generalize like we can on, on a day to day basis. So OK, so to summarize here, like um, what I'm trying, essentially trying to say here is uh, the point of all of this, of, of what all that was before there was, you know, AI, data science, machine learning is uh, not a silver bullet in 2020. You, you can't take AI and machine learning and just throw it at any problem and hope it's going to magically solve it. Uh, you know, these systems are not going to be taking your job anytime soon. But uh, the point of this is essentially, I'm trying to essentially lower your expectations a little bit uh, because, because of the hype, essentially. So maybe your, your expectations have been lowered a little bit. And you might be scratching your head now thinking like, OK, Paul, so these, this isn't that good. but then why 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 use machine learning at all? Uh, and to and to kind of answer that question, um, I, I I'll follow it up with a statement, and that statement is this: so the introduction of these uh, these new algorithms, these machine learning algorithms, has like vastly increased the amount of problems that can be tackled by computers. And to sort of expand upon what that statement means, uh, we could, I think I'll walk you through an, another example. So uh, let's 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 do just that. So okay, so here I have an, an image of a, a man named John, um, and I'm going to use my traditional computer science toolkit to try develop an algorithm for you now uh, uh, to do, to try identify John's face in this image. Now. Um, uh, so I don't know if this is the right way of doing it. Like this is just something I just thought of on the fly for this presentation. It might not be the right way using traditional computer science techniques from like 30 years ago, but I'm going to have a crack at it. So OK, so this is the idea in uh, computer science of masks. So th they essentially look like this. And the idea is to um, essentially put like a mask over certain points uh, in an image and then do a, a bitwise and comparison of between the pixels here and like say the pixels in this oval. So if I wanted to detect an eye, what I could do is uh, put a, a, a mask over here and like move it across the screen. And um, as it moved over say this area here, you, you can come up with like a manual rule to say like if we detected enough like white in this area, for example, uh, you know, you could set a threshold, say if it's like 30% white, we detect 30% white, OK, that's a good that's a good uh, reference point for detecting an eye. And then we run it again, run that through. It comes over here and lo and behold, it, it crosses that threshold and discovers an eye. Uh, we could do the same thing for the mouth. So we could say like uh, apply a bitwise and over the mouth for the color pink. And if we get like enough pink crossing a th certain threshold, then we can say that's a mouth. And then you can, you can you can imagine you can keep going with this idea. So you could have like a uh, I don't know, some kind of masking over his nose some kind of masking over his ears, uh, his beard, his hair, if you will. And you can keep going with this. But what if I was to say to you, like, what if John was to smile? So, you know, we'd have to go back. We'd have to write another rule uh, uh, where we have like a, a bigger oval to capture his his smile. And then maybe even say like, oh, we have to detect this, his, the color of his teeth and a threshold on that. Um, what if John changed the angle of his head? You know, his eyes would be in a different location. Um, uh, uh, and again, we would have to write different rules for that. What if John was to wear glasses and, you know, the, the reflection of his glasses changed uh, the, the thresholding on his eyes? We'd have to, again, write, uh, write different rules and shaving his beard, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being is that if we were to continue using this like rule-based if-then approach, um, it would be quite hard to write manually, construct an algorithm to detect just just one single person, in this case, John, um, uh, uh, using traditional computer science techniques. 
Um, so if, again, if there's any data scientists or machine learning people listening right now, you can you'll probably like uh, uh, might fall asleep. But just bear with me for two minutes. So for those of you who who, who don't know how we'd solve the same problem using machine learning, what we could do is uh, you know build up a data set of uh, images of John where he's like not smiling, where he is smiling, where he doesn't have a beard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we also take the associated labels uh, of, of whatever's in that image, in this case, John. Um, we do the same thing for images that aren't John. We build up a nice big catalog of images that aren't John and the associated labels. We then pass those through the uh, machine learning algorithm, which in this case is a neural network, and, uh, and train it. The, the, the important part here, though, is the training is automated. So the, the only thing is you need to do is get the data, get the labels for the data, and uh, you can automatically train a model. So what you would uh, what you'd now do next is um, the idea is say we pass in an image of, of, of John that the, the network, the model hasn't seen yet. We pass it in. It would hopefully be able to classify him as John and you know and pass in another image that's not John and hopefully it would classify it as not John. So okay, so the point of all of this is not to sort of explain to you how image classification works, but to sort of get across the idea that um, machine learning has like really increased the problems we can tackle with computers. And I can I've sort of illustrated this for you in this image over here. Uh, so in this little like uh, black black oval, you could kind of say this is like to just the problems that we could tackle with like traditional computer science techniques, you know. Uh, we could do image classification, but it would be really hard and very fragile and probably not break. But, you know, throw in some machine learning techniques and uh, um, the, 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 essentially the problems, the problems that we can tackle have, have vastly increased. The problem space is what we like to say machine learning has increased. Of course, there's problems outside the space that, uh, that still cannot be tackled, but eventually they will, eventually we'll get to them. But like for now, the, the key point to take away here is we've essentially increased our the, the ability of uh, of problems that computers can tackle in 2020 with these machine learning techniques. So I'm trying to get to a point here, and uh, the point is kind of it's it's subtle, but I I hope I hope it's a, it's a subtle shift in thinking. So I try to hammer home the the point that like AI is not a silver bullet. It's it's not this magical thing that's gonna just magically solve your problems. You still need to build like custom logic around it to make it work and plug it into existing systems like existing systems here. Um, but it has vastly increased our ability to solve like new problems um, that we could never solve before. So I kind of want to like put forward a new way of thinking about uh, what machine learning is. And it's essentially, uh, <laughs> to, to cut a long story short, it's essentially this. It's machine learning, AI data science is essentially just another tool in your, uh, in your computer science toolkit that you can use to solve problems. So it's it's vastly increased the problems that you can solve and, and, and solutions that you can build, but it's just another tool. Um, it's not the silver bullet. It's just another tool that you can use to solve problems. Um, and and we'll get to what uh, we'll get to the applied machine learning problems in a moment. But yeah, but I, I want to make a key difference here that like machine learning, AI, data science, whatever you want to call it, is it's not just like upgrading from say like a screwdriver to a power drill. It's kind of moving from like uh, a screwdriver to uh, you know this. It's, it, it's a super tool. Like if the ancient Romans had uh, these cranes, which I'm going to show you right now, uh, they would have built like vastly bigger uh, I don't know, colosseums, or you know they would have been able to solve diff a different sort of genre of problems. So I'll just quickly show you this because it's kind of cool. But uh, for anyone that's ever wondered how these cranes uh, assemble themselves uh, or get built, they actually assemble themselves. So you can kind of see that in this process here. Uh, they they lift the the they lift themselves up like so, and uh, uh, obviously pick the piece up from the ground and then insert it, drop it down, and stuff. So if you never knew that, that that's how all these cranes work. And I, I kind of want you to think of machine learning. Being in this category, it's it's not just uh, it's not just a tool; it's a, it's a super tool. Okay, so that kind of sets the stage for uh, to kind of how to think about machine learning and what it can do. Um, so now 
I'm going to go across a couple of the tools. Um, again, for again, I'll, I'll keep prefacing this for the data scientists guys. This is going to be really trivial for you. Uh, and also for some of the more general audience, this might be trivial for you too, because as humans, you have these abilities naturally. But um, I really want you to hold on to these ideas because they're they kind of are key to being able to build applied machine learning, uh, to be able to solve applied machine learning problems uh, uh, using these tools that we talked to, that we'll talk about now. Okay, so the first one is uh, classification. So uh, again, as a human, you do this on a day to day basis and you don't even think about it, um, but machine learning can do it too. And what is it? So let's say, for example, you are washing your dishes. You uh, you, re you reach into the basin, you pull uh, you pull out a clean um, you look at it, fork and you're like, OK, that's a fork. You open up the drawer and put it in the fork basket. You reach into the basin again, uh, you move your hand around and you pull out like a knife and you, look, you, you instantly classify it as a knife and put it in the the knife basket. Uh, and the key thing from this little story is that uh, machine learning can do this too. So humans are innately built with this ability and machine machine learning has learned how to do it too. So uh, this, this use case, uh, this is used all over the place in systems that you don't even think about like for example, if you uh, this is used in um, online email services. So if you have spam email coming in, uh, machine learning classifiers are used to detect like whether it's a spam email or whether it's a non-spam and put it into the right basket, if you will, the right uh, the right bucket. So an, another cool use case is this company Tilter. Um, they are actually based here in Sydney, so I just thought it'd be that's why it'd be a cool use case. Um, I'm mates with the, with the the CEO of this company too, um, and uh, what they've essentially done, um, little uh, little blooper. If anyone has been to the uh, Woolworths and Wynyard, I believe that's what that is there. <laughs> but um, they've essentially built a machine learning system, uh, an applied machine learning system that's capable of using computer vision to. Uh, but instead of like using barcodes, they just like look at the picture and are able to classify it, put it into like a bucket. Uh, in this case, the broccoli bucket uh, in this part of the video. Um, uh, uh, and then, you know, use traditional techniques to say attach a price, say, say 50 bucks or something. Um, yeah, so uh, so 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 that's that's essentially the, the first tool in the toolkit, which is classification. Um, the, the next tool, which is also kind of trivial, but again, bear with me, hold on to these because we're going to use them in a second, um, is prediction. And we've been doing prediction for a while. Hum, uh, you know, humans have been doing it for like almost 100 years with weather prediction. Um, a common use case of prediction, you know, prediction is like, just to be more clear on what that is, is like predicting some number or some event in the future. So uh, the weather is one, predicting the temperature to tomorrow. So what you do is you get a whole bunch of data from the past and you try to predict, you know, what the temperature is going to be in the future. And where it's commonly used is uh, in, you know, stock market trading. So a lot of this is used on Wall Street to make uh, really quickly make uh, trades is uh, machine learning is doing that. Uh, and if, if you had used uh, your prediction algorithm to buy Tesla shares around here, that would have been really good for you. Um, but some other like really good use cases for prediction uh, off the top of my head. Um, predictions being used right now, for example, for an example, to do uh, inventory predictions. So say, for example, you uh, own, own a clothing store and you have a uh, you want to predict the amount of T-shirts you're going to sell in, in the next week. It's, it's, it's really useful to keep your inventory down if you own a clothing store, because uh, if you own a small business, most small business owners will tell you that uh, you know, you want to have as much cash as possible. Cash is king and locking your cash up into a physical asset is not a good idea. So you want to keep your inventory minimized and your stock flowing out is like you want to get that like in the inflow to outflow. Right. And the, the way you can do this is with predictions. You can like predict how many T-shirts you might sell in that week or whatever. So that's prediction. Uh, and this is just a little little uh, little image of uh, one of these uh, uh, regressors being, being being trained in real time. Right. So uh, the next tool, which has sort of come along come along on board uh, in the last, I'd say, five years, it's really starting to come into industry now, is machine learning being applied to control scenarios. So uh, 
traditionally, it's like, like we talked about with the, the example of that Atari thing in the, at the beginning, that was control. Um, these systems are kind of fragile, so uh, they're getting less and less such, but it's important to note out that they are still kind of fragile. And that's the reason why we're only starting, sort of starting to see them uh, uh, in, the, in the last five years moving into industry. So just uh, to quickly essentially explain what control is, it's essentially like controlling something, or in this case, it could be a car. But um, I've got a use case here from a, from a couple of years ago. Uh, Stanford U University used a, a type of machine learning known as reinforcement learning to train up this, this helicopter. And uh, they got it to do a whole bunch of stunts. And again, this is just using purely machine learning. Uh, there's no nobody controlling this. So there's a whole bunch of really cool stunts here. You can see it uh, doing that. It's, it's rolling through all the different stunts. Um, it's flying upside down. It's doing stationary rolls, uh, stationary flips. And one of the cool ones that I really like is, is, is this one here where it like tick, does the tick tock. It looks like a, a clock from uh, from the, the 19th century. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but that's uh, one use case is controlling things like autonomous helicopters or drones. Another cool one, this is from last year, is uh, a company called OpenAI. Uh, again, trained a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm to do control. And the objective here was to solve a Rubik's Cube. So this is uh, using a, a robotic arm. So that's the key thing. And this is a really, really hard problem. Uh, uh, if you could try design a system to do this with traditional computer science techniques, uh, you'd be uh, You'd, sp you'd be spending a lot of time doing that. And um, they were able to achieve this goal uh, late last year, I believe. Um, I'll just quickly fast forward to the points. But you can see it. Uh, you can see the algorithm controlling the, the, the Rubik's Cube here to try and solve it. And the kind of scary thing is, is the way it's manipulating, manipulating the, bo the block and also like moving its hand. It looks very human-like. Uh, so, um, uh, Whilst I said that AI is not a silver bullet at the start of this talk, um, I am not. I was not joking when when I said that like we've made a lot of progress in the last ten years, and I still think that the next ten years are going to be very interesting too. All right, so that's uh, that's control, and um, for the for the final tool, tool number four is a generation. So we've been through uh, classification, prediction. Uh, and control. So this last one, I sort of, when I was practicing for this presentation yesterday, um, I sort of thought, you know, what if are there any other fundamental ones out there that need to be added? On? And I think this kind of falls into the category. So, so generation is the idea of using machine learning models to generate uh, any like uh, data. So the data can be kind of anything. And um, and I don't know if you know this, but you uh, actually, if you use a, a digital assistant on your phone or in a home home device. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis to, to say, hey, blah, blah, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, that is actually machine learning talking back to you. So uh, those tech companies, they didn't go off and just like record people's voices and then send back bits of words to make up uh, uh, the, the, voice come, the voice creation. That has been generated on the fly and that has been done by machine learning, and specifically machine, generation, machine learning generation. So that's another use case, but we'll kind of get to, uh, we'll talk a little bit about machine learning generation right at the end of the talk. All right, so that's kind of the four tools. So now let's put it all together. So let's, let's so we, we've, we've talked about like, uh, it's not a silver bullet, uh, it's increased our ability to solve real world problems. Um, there's, a, there's a few tools you need to know, like you can sort of put them together. Um, how does this now form this new field, which we, which, which we call applied machine learning? So I, I'm going to I'm going to sort of put this forward uh, by contrasting it against what I call uh, traditional predictive analytics. So uh, what I would what I would term as like pr traditional predictive analytics is like. Uh, Say you are like a really a really large company, and you wanted to uh, forecast the sales, uh, forecast the revenue for that quarter, uh, and then uh, based on a whole bunch of sort of opportunities that are available to you. So if you if you choose opportunity A, uh, you know that could lead to a certain revenue outcome. If you choose opportunity B, that could lead to a certain uh, certain a certain revenue outcome. So uh, this is this is kind of uh, it's corporate. 
predictive analytics, but kind of a lot of what data science is all about as well is sort of like these um, coming up with essentially discovering insights about certain possibilities that could occur, like whether you're sending out, whether, you, whether you're trying to maximize uh, your click through rate on an email campaign uh, and you discover that there's a certain segment of people um, that you know could be influenced more or whatever. I'll, I would like to uh, put forward the idea that this field was kind of saturated um, and saturated for uh, two major reasons. Um, the, the first reason is that there's only so many companies that can essentially afford to do this because it's actually quite expensive to run these, these teams, um, which, which also fundamentally limits how many positions are available. And uh, universities are cranking out uh, people with masters of data science and uh, as, as along with like this online training you can take now, uh, there's, there's companies like General Assembly, which I will be pre um, presenting at next week, I think. But like there's a there's a like a, there's a there's a there's a flood of people entering the market and there's only so many roles to be filled. So essentially, like I think that this field of predictive analytics, even if you include like traditional like uh, uh, Power BI and stuff like that, that's essentially starting to saturate. Um, and the other reason that I think that this has reached sort of a saturation point is is this, and this this is kind of the the crux of it all really is that you have these these really talented data scientist teams go off and they'll discover some insights that can like lead to to like a minimization of something or a maximization of something or like maximizing revenue or minimizing um, i don't know um, your inventory or something your data scientists will go off they'll discover what that information is and then, then they pass it along to their boss but it, 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 you really need a very talented uh uh, uh like advocate uh, boss, advocate, boss, I don't know what, what you want to call it, to sort of uh, push those insights all the way up to the chain to to, to senior management to say, OK, we need to take action. Um, and, I, and I think the amount of people that can do that is limited too. So with these two points, um, I, I think that like the predictive analytics field is sort of reaching a threshold. It will continue to grow, of course, but I think it's going to be like linear growth. Um, but where I th think this is where we can sort of contrast this is to this new field, which we just called applied applied machine learning, um, and I, I, I guess like what is applied machine learning? I mean, so you're thinking like what is that? Um, applied machine learning to me is the integration of those machine learning tools that we talked about earlier, where you have like classification, prediction, uh, 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 generation, and control are, are, uh, applied to a real world problem. And then interfaceable by a by a, like a, a use like a really slick user interface. Um, okay, so okay, so to sort of back up a little bit and see why that is, let's walk through another problem. Uh, and 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 here we have okay, so here we have uh, an, an autonomous driving um, problem. Let's say you are an, auto an autonomous driving company, and you wanted to. Uh, for this very specific problem of you know taking a right turn at an intersection, you wanted to design a machine learning system um, to to achieve that goal. So this is on the hard end of the applied machine learning spectrum, but but just just bear with me on this. So so okay, so if you're this white car and you're traveling along, how would you you know build a system using those tools I just talked about earlier to solve this problem? It's 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 quite hard. It's very hard. Okay, so the first thing you probably need. Is a classification system. You need to be able to to classify the lines on the road. So you're driving along. You need to know like there's a line over there and there's a line over there, and this could be a potential like a yield area right here. So we need to slow down. You need a, probably a separate classification system to to like read uh, red, amber, green. Like if it's green, I should go. Um, you know, if, if it's red, I should obviously stop. Um, and then you need like to classify like. Uh, oncoming cars, like a, a machine vision system constantly detecting to see whether there's cars, or in this case, we have a, a bicycle or a pedestrian. Um, so that's the first part, the first sort of like element we need to solve this problem. The next element would be like prediction. So we need to say this car is oncoming and it's doing 50 kilometers an hour. We need a machine uh, machine learning system to be able to predict what its speed's going to be in order to take that action. So if it's going to, if I'm, if our prediction system is saying, OK, this car is likely to continue at 50 kilometers an hour, then we should probably stop here because turning white would not probably be the best idea. 
But if 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 my prediction system is saying okay, it's doing two kilometers an hour, uh, then that's probably a better uh, chances of taking that right turn. But of course, we still need to like uh, take these uh, pedestrian and, and and cyclists into account. So this prediction, and then of course uh, to, to to sort of combine it all together, we need a control system that's taking in the classifications coming in from those other systems. To the predictions coming from those other systems, combining it all and sort of figuring out what to do with the wheels. You know, like okay, I'm going to apply a, a voltage to the wheels to make them go. Um, and and again, it's important to stress here that we're still going to use traditional computer science techniques like if-then logic, a whole bunch of rules to sort of tie all the stuff together. And that's exactly what these companies are doing. Um, but it's important to note that we are sort of like plugging these together like Lego bricks. And um, and and building us solving essentially a really hard problem by uh, uh, stacking the machine learning tools together. So again, um, to, to sort of define then what I what I mean by applied machine learning, um, I, I personally think it has the following definition. Uh, so I think that machine learning is uh, is 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 when you've used like two or more types of machine learning to solve a problem. So again. Um, uh, when you when when you like when you when you're trying to solve the uh, uh, autonomous driving problem, you were we were combining three there. Um, but of course, that's that's not uh, the only use case. Um, applied machine learning is also when you have exposed your machine learning model uh, uh, through an API uh, as an API. So you have say a, a front end and you are calling your machine learning model uh, on on the back end because a lot of traditional data science, as it's done right now, you'll you'll train up a model, say for um, a certain email campaign or something. That model is trained, and then it's discarded, and then you train another one, and you discard it. So, the idea with applied machine learning is yes, you might still update your models, but they're deployed either on the cloud uh, through Azure or what have you, um, as an API, which another service then calls, um, or or. Uh, this goes both ways. You call somebody else's machine learning API to do that part of the problem for you. And this is kind of where it starts to get easier because uh, before you were like having to do all this all this hard stuff, um, you can essentially call other people's APIs. And I'll, I'll show a couple. I'll show you a couple uh, which you can you know use if you'd like um, uh, uh, in the next part of this talk. And then, then the final part that I'd say is part of this uh, applied machine learning paradigm is. Whatever solution you come up with, it's interactable via a graphical user interface. So, you know, traditionally, uh, again, with data science, a lot of the stuff is um, only accessible via the command line. So what that is is like via, you know, the command prompt from the 1980s where you, you type in commands and you, you tell the computer what to do. Um, a lot of machine learning is still done like that. And there's, there's no, look, I'm not saying there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all, but uh, I think to do applied machine learning to really bring this, this technology down to uh, for everyone to use, you're going to have to create a really slick user uh, user interface, user experience for for end users for them to use your solution. So by combining all three of these, you can really solve uh, like quite hard uh, problems and um, and and then also make the technology more accessible. And I really believe that uh, this this field of applied machine learning is where the next sort of phase of growth is going to come from. Where uh, we identify lots of sort of applications, sorry, sorry, lots of problems that can be solved by this technology, and then we build out uh, a machine learning stack and sort of a user interface experience to solve that problem. So okay, so like like I mentioned before, uh, autonomous driving is is on the hard side of of, of uh, applied machine learning, um, but let's now walk through of a more real real world use case of AML. Uh, to sort of sh show you what I mean by it. Um, I've got the approval from my client Blink to show you this. Um, I, there's certain things I can't show you, but I'll try to show you as much as I can. And then um, hopefully it'll give you more of a feel of, of what, what, where, this, where the field is essentially moving. All right, so uh, we have a Blink running here. I'll just re-log into it again. So again, like, if you were to land on this as uh, as an end user, you wouldn't expect that you're about to interact with a machine learning platform. To you, it just looks like uh, you know any other website. So I'm gonna log in.
and uh, we greeted you know with uh, a questionnaire. So the just to backtrack a little bit here, Blink is a uh, some work we did for a client where uh, they we, we created the, a cyber ins insurance portal for them essentially. And the goal of this is we ask them uh, we ask end users a, a series of questions, and based on the, the their answers, we calculate their risk. But we go and that's again also using machine learning. But we go one step further and we, we recommend the best insurance policy based on their responses. And uh, I'd, uh, I'd just like to quickly show you how, how sort of seamless this all is. So, you know, you, you come in here, you select what profession you are. Let's say we are education. Uh, you select uh, how much you earn. And then how, how much of your, you, you answer a couple of questions. And then it gives you sort of your initial risk score. Um, and then uh, there's a phase two of the questionnaire sort of to go more in depth. I'll just quickly go through this because it's not really that important. But there's a lot of sort of, we, we sort of trying to like deep dive here and to figure out uh, the end user's cybersecurity needs. And it takes you to a dashboard right at the end. So you get your cybersecurity rating uh, based upon five different fields in this case. Um, and uh, in the background here, we've called machine uh, learning services. So these are running on virtual machines. We have uh, we have Blink running right here on Azure. Uh, and the, the policy recommendation machine learning service, which is also on a virtual machine, just for this example, we, we use uh, other technology now, but just for this example, um, we, we call the machine uh, learning service to generate the, the cyber policies uh, for this particular, for my for, for me, for my answers that I just provided to the system. Um, and based on those answers, we went off and uh, recommended the the best match the best matching policies based on the answers that I just provided just before that. So um, if I click the the get policies button, these uh, three, I think these. Yeah, these three policies are machine learning uh, recommendations from the from the back end. Uh, this this uh, summary here is generated via machine learning. Um, uh, we have the features of the policy itself are generated using machine learning. The price of the policy, how much they're going to be paying per year, again, is all all three of those three separate machine learning services running on that virtual machine. Um, and again, this is an example of applied machine learning. You didn't see me go here on the, like, the command prompt and bring it up and like, you know, try to type out uh, a whole bunch of command line things to, to figure out what's the best insurance policy for you. Uh, we just naturally matched that with a beautiful UI UX experience um, and, and then served it up to the customers. This makes the technology very, very accessible. And I, I really, really, truly believe that this is going to be the, the force that drives uh, machine learning truly like the next next wave of growth for the next five to 10 years uh, for various, various applications. So, OK, so just to sort of round up this talk now, um, I'd like to uh, give you sort of a couple of areas which you can start thinking about where you can apply those those uh, those sort of tools, which were prediction, classification, uh, control and generation. So uh, the first the first area is natural language processing. So what this means uh, is machine learning has uh, over the, again over the last five to ten years has really uh, its, its ability to understand text has like grown in leaps and bounds. Like the things we can do with text now is insane. And uh, if you can imagine that most of the of, of our information is stored at text, there's a lot of problems you can solve using these machine learning texts in the natural language processing space. So if, if there's some like, let's, before I showed you an example where we, where we, uh, where we analyzed uh, uh, insurance policies, cybersecurity insurance policies, um, you could do that same thing for some other field too. Like if there's some problem you're thinking of, 
uh, machine learning now has the ability to sort of understand in, in a machine way the, the, the text and then match that to some other problem which you might be able to solve. Um, computer vision, that's another one. So I walked you through the, the example of identifying John's face at the start of this talk. But you know, uh, there's so many other applications you could do with com computer vision and we're only just getting started. So you can imagine if like, off the top of my head, if you're a farmer and uh, you want to like create an application for f flying a drone out over your farm and detecting parts of your crop that may be like have pests or something, you could not do this with computer vision. So computer vision has the ability to sort of classify which parts of the crop might be, uh, you know, have pests, or you could fly your drone out and detect where there's weeds or something, and then and then the farmer can, can then deal with it, thus increasing the yield of their crop. That's just something off the top of my head, but there's so many other things you could do. You could like use computer vision. I know there was a company I met two years ago that they were using to discover a new mineral deposits out, out in Australia, some like, uh, so uh, we have lots of natural minerals here in Australia, and a lot of them haven't been tapped and even discovered yet. And there was a company that was going out analyzing satellite imagery to try to determine uh, where the next ore deposit, iron ore deposit might be. Um, another field uh, is recommendation. So uh, with the current situation that's going on, a lot of people have probably been spending time on Netflix or, or Spotify. And when you log into those applications, a lot of you might not even realize that uh, the user interface you experience, you're interacting with a lot of that is machine learning on the back end, like the recommendations of songs to play are all coming from, are all being generated by machine learning. Even like when you finish a playlist and the, and the next song, song st starts automatically, that's machine learning selecting uh, the next song for you. So um, whilst there are feels like with movies and uh, music have been sort of, you could, you could arguably say that those are very mature uh, recommendation products, they are, they, we have like barely scratched the surface on recommendation in terms of uh, applications that could be um, produced. So say, say for example, again off the top of my head, if, uh, if you were uh, given the current situation, um, let's say I wanted to uh, create a uh, customized workout, you know, to, to train uh, and workout uh, um, schedule for myself. But, um, you know, I don't necessarily like lifting weights. I just want to do cardio stuff. So I, I put a whole bunch of stuff into the system through a user interface. And on the back end, the machine learning figures out like, okay, we, we should probably serve him some Thai, Thai kickboxing stuff or some um, running um, around the park or whatever that might be. And then build that, uh, uh, you know, uh, workout plan for me. So what I'm trying to say there is that recommendation is like it's, it's, a, it's a field that's ripe for the taking and all you need to do is think of an idea and uh, go for it. And the last field, which I'm gonna to touch on right at the end of this talk is generation. Um, this is a relatively new field. Uh, people have been doing it for a while, but it's really starting to bear fruit now. Uh, and like I showed you before, you can generate voice uh, for your voice assistant or, or uh, in your phone or on your home, your home assistant or whatever. But you can, um, you can use machine learning to generate much, much more. And I know that a certain company which uh, has a mouse as their logo, or was their logo, uh, they seriously investigate in using this technology for automating like the creation of, of cartoons and um, and uh, and digital content uh, for, for their various shows. Um, generation can also be used for uh, the whole uh, video game industry because a lot of the time you need to like generate textures for for like virtual virtual objects and that can be done again using generation so uh, again just putting these ideas and you're planting these seeds in your mind to hopefully uh, so hopefully you can kick off the next the next great product all right so uh, the future so just quickly want to brush over where this field is going um with two with two use cases so there's been um uh, a lot of talk around deep fakes uh, uh, and this is work that was released uh, this time last year, so it really is quite old. Um, but but what I'd like to just showcase here is uh, in, in, in this in, in this example, this researcher trained two separate machine learning systems. They trained a, um, a face landmark detector to apply it. Um, I'll, I'll just show you. Okay, so what you have here is 
the face landmark detector. So just like I was talking about before, it was like sort of classifying all the all the features on this particular person that's that's driving the the, the video. So this is an input video. We have a system classifying the, the face landmarks on the person's face. And then what we have here is we have our, I think eight only eight images, so only eight images in our data set. And there's a there's a second system here that is then combining this with this data to to drive the image. Um, so I'll just quickly go back to that example so you can see it. Uh, so quite incredible, like with from eight images, we are able to move this, make this guy's uh, face essentially match uh, the, the driving video. So uh, uh, they sort of went and pushed this idea forward um, a little bit and uh, got to this point here. I'll just quickly get to the end of the video. Um, and did what's called one shot learning. So what zero zero shot. So they had a single image and again using that, that system where you have a, an input video driving, driving it and like a face detector. So somebody else would be talking here. it will be like myself talking to drive in this case uh, Marilyn Monroe's face. You can see Marilyn Monroe like moving around. Uh, some other cool ones here. We have Sigmund Freud being uh, being brought to life. Uh, we have uh, Albert Einstein. This is a famous image of him. And again, you know, and this is uh, like well, there might be some artifacts here. Like you can see, this it's not quite perfect. Um, case in point is this is only getting better and better with every year. So like we'll eventually be able to just drive the stuff. And this is I think the coolest one is like animating the the Mona Lisa. Um, and bringing bringing her to life, so that's that's one use case of, uh, of of machine learning generation. And again, you could wrap this with a, like a, a really good user user interface, um, and and go, go for gold. Um, and uh, here's another one. So uh, if any of you were concerned about uh, my use of John earlier uh, as a use case to show showcase how to do computer vision, uh, John actually uh, as a spoiler alert is that John doesn't actually exist. Um, he was generated using um, computer uh, uh, computer machine learning generation. Uh, and this is uh, research that was literally released last week. Um, these researchers developed a system where they could take a, a base image, in this case, Emma Watson, and they can uh, just by controlling these parameters over here, um, make her, we, we have gender, we have smiling, we have hair, we have uh, age. So I'll just quickly run through that. So um, here they're making her younger, then they, I think they make her older. Uh, again, these images are generated, so this person does not exist. <laughs> it's been computer generated by a, a, a machine learning model. And I believe John is somewhere around this. There he is. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's John being, uh, having his sex changed and John having glasses added. So uh, again, this, this this field is moving really fast, and um, it's 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 really uh, it's really fantastic to be a part of it. So yeah, uh, uh, if you would like to reach out to me, um, that's my email address. Um, and I just uh, if Nadia wouldn't mind just wouldn't mind just plugging one last thing, which is uh, this tool we created um, for 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 the. the the COVID-19 crisis. If, if you are uh, information around the grants and stuff, so we, we we created this tool in about two and a half weeks with uh, uh, repurposing our questions. Uh, and um, yeah, this tool is able to essentially, if you're a small to medium enterprise or an individual, uh, uh, you can go through, um, sort of find what grants you might be eligible for. Just by uh, you know going through here, you answer a couple of questions, and then it tells you what ones you might. Seems like to say. Uh, Nadia, are you there? I am here. Sorry about that. Uh, my internet 
kind of disconnected <laughs> for a bit, but I'm here. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, my name is Nadia. I'm the Community and Events Manager at the Microsoft Reactor in Sydney. I thought I would just take you through some of the events that we have up and coming while Paul goes through our Q&A. Uh, so if you want to see all the events, and you may have come across them already, check out our Microsoft Reactor Sydney beta page. Um, and on this page, you'll be able to see not only our events, but um, some of the global events that we have uh, going on as well. We have a lot of content and workshops that are coming through from our Microsoft corporate. Um, so that one of the ones that we have coming up next week is how to manipulate and clean your Jupyter notebook. So this is a session about, you know, learning about the best practices and how to get your data um, ready. We do have a, another session called how to break into data science. That's a panel session. Uh, Paul's actually going to be speaking on this panel as well. Uh, we've got a, a panel of local experts that break down the growing field of you know, data by demystifying the differences between data science and data analytics and highlighting ways that data can advance um, your career. We've also got a, another session on top ways to deliver code to the cloud. Um, so this will be delivered from our US team and it highlights the easiest ways for developers to deliver their code to the cloud and the best ways to reliably make and maintain product, um, production code. So if you're interested in any of these sessions, please register at Microsoft Reactor Sydney. Um, you know, if you also want to see any similar content or recommendations on content you might want to see, feel free to send us a comment. You can even pop some comments in the Q&A box uh, this evening. Um, other than that, I will hand it back over to Paul, who's going to be answering some of your Q&A questions that have just come through. Thank you, Paul. Um, thanks, Nadia. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, just quickly going through the Q&A uh, uh, channel here. There's actually a lot of uh, really good uh, questions. So I'm going to try to answer as many as I can. Um, uh, so there's a question here from Phoebe uh, at 6.07 p.m. The question is, I am interested in entering AI as a product manager. Do you think studying online courses like ones in uh, Audacity, or Audacity, <laughs> I think I know what she means, to become a, a PM in AI, would this be helpful? So um, uh, yes, definitely. Uh, there are. Uh, so I'll just say that one thing though, like this, because this field's become so, uh, like, you know, people were saying a couple of years ago, it's like being a data scientist is, is the sexiest job of, of the 2020s or something. A lot of people have uh, created content on the internet to teach you machine learning, data science, and AI. And uh, so just be wary of the sort of, there's a lot of content that, that's out there that's average. Um, but strangely enough, a lot of the best stuff is actually free. So just off the top of my head, uh, there is a course called, um, uh, 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 what is it called again? Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Foster AI. So if you go to, uh, uh, Nadia, do you mind if, how do I uh, share my screen again? Um, Uh, this one. All right. So, uh, if my screen's coming through, if you go to uh, fostai.com, I think it's fost.ai. This is a. I, I, I would actually argue one of the one of the good uh, one of the better courses out there for sort of going over and just learning the basics of uh, machine learning. Um, there is, they sort of take the top down approach, which is like, if you know how to code, then they sort of use coding. Uh, uh, so in, in other words, real world problems and, and exercises to teach you the stuff instead of throwing a whole bunch of maths at you. Um, but if you like the maths too, there's other courses, which I'll show you, show you now. But uh, yeah, in a nutshell, you can learn deep learning here. Uh, they have part two is the, the, the in-depth part, part one, which is what this course is about is, is the, uh, the best part. And then there's like an introduction to machine learning. I would take this one first. The other good one that is often recommended is this one. Uh, uh, I think it's called. Uh, so if, you, if you're more into your mathematics, uh, I would suggest you uh, take this course um, by Andrew Ng. He is one of the founding fathers, if you want to call it that, of the whole MOOC genre, which is you know online learning. 
And uh, he created this, uh, if you want to learn about uh, machine learning, and if mathematics is your thing, then I'd suggest you take this one. If sort of learning from uh, uh, practical examples and coding is your thing, this is, and then of course, uh, if, no, if none of this works for you, I would recommend just like go on YouTube and just find the guy that explains it the best and follow that guy. Like, because not every ex explanation will be suited for you. Like, I learn better of certain explanations than other things. Um, uh, so yeah, definitely study online. Um, if you want to be a product manager, it it helps in, in spades to know what like what you're talking about essentially. So definitely learn. Um, I am an engineer, but my tools. So Phoebe also said I'm an engineer, but my tools are very different from data engineering. Uh, could you? So I, I'm, I'm assuming engineer is uh, the traditional sense of uh, like like a civil engineer or electrical engineer. Um, you know. If you come from any scientific discipline, it's quite easy to transition over to machine learning because the scientific method is the, the heart of, of, the, of it all. So you are essentially creating models to uh, to test hypotheses. So you want to, for example, say, I uh, would like to um, see whether if I send this email campaign out, if that's going to change uh, whether people buy toilet paper or something, OK? And um, uh, you're using the scientific method there. So any any sort of discipline, where you, whether it's mathematics, whether it's science, where you've done like biology, whether it's engineering, it's kind of makes it easier to transition to this field too. That's not saying that you can't, if you not, haven't done that, you can't do it either. Like for example, in this, uh, what I, on the thing that I'm sharing on my screen, one of the courses is computational linear, linear algebra. So if you need to brush up on your maths, you know, there's courses out there for you for free. Um, for the specific piece of math you need to know for machine learning that are available. So that part's um, covered. Uh, expectations for AI. So somebody called Anonymous said, uh, what are your expectations for AI in the next 10 years? Um, you know, I think uh, like, uh, I guess the whole point of this talk is applied machine learning is gonna be a, a huge thing. So there's gonna be startups, many startups creating apps uh, you could, uh, whether they web apps, whether they apps on your phone to tackle um, use cases that they've thought like, hey, I can use prediction, I can use classification, I can use control to 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 solve problem X, and then wrap that with a user interface, and you know you that 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 that's going to be huge. Um, but I guess uh, that's that's that part. But the other part which I mentioned is like the whole, I think the generation field of generating content is also going to be huge. Like uh, how awesome would it be if you could like automatically write scripts for a movie? Um, maybe not even write them with a computer, but like have it assist you. So just give you ideas and then you can t edit them yourself or have it generate, uh, you know, like I was showing you before, uh, the, the just have a single person move their head and then just automatically generate Gollum for, from Lord of the Rings. Whereas before that took like a whole bunch of 3D artists working really hard to get that model looking right and stuff. You'll now be able to just generate it using machine learning. So I think the generative field is going to be big too. And then to sort of, like, I'll put an asterisk on this. I think like robotics is going to be big as well, but uh, it's kind of hard to say when that will be. It's not, it will be probably in the next 10 years, but not in the next five. That's just like Paul, Pull estimate on that one. Um, uh, yeah, so someone asked for the meetups. Um, uh, Nadia was kind enough to share those. Um, AI jobs advertise. A lot of uh, people are constantly posting jobs on uh, LinkedIn. Um, I, I can see them being posted all the time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, your your normal channels like Seek and uh, the other one. one um, I'm thinking of. Um, Someone, someone else here asked, I enjoy AI use cases very much and really enjoy like the problems they solve, but do I have to learn how to write ML algorithms or learn statistics to enter the field of work? Okay, so this is a this is a very good question. Uh, something I did not show in my in my talk, which I meant to show, I just forgot, was um, I mentioned in the talk that, you know, uh, one of the use cases for uh, applied machine learning is uh, one criteria is uh, the idea of um, exposing 
senior machine learning service. So, so you, know, you do not need to learn machine learning necessarily. You don't need to know if you don't want to. Uh, more and more people are exposing their own services as an API, which you can interact with. Um, for example, I brought this up as an example here. So Azure has this thing called cognitive services. Um, and it's essentially uh, 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 a whole bunch of uh, microservices which you can use to build your applications. And they're just APIs. Like you don't necessarily have to know how it works. You just have to know what you need to put into it and what the service produces. You can kind of treat this as bad as it sounds. Uh, you can kind of treat it as a black box, but that's not a bad thing. It's actually awesome because it saves you heaps of time. It's only when you want to like dive down into the weeds and really customize some small thing that you have to learn the the the, uh, the theory, um, or you can even hire someone to do it. <laughs> that's what most people do. Um, all right. Uh, Uh, so someone asked, predictive analytics has reached the limit. Do you need data scientists and, and statisticians don't have many jobs? So uh, um, to answer this question, I just don't think there's that many jobs out there for the field. Uh, like I said in the talk, I think they're going to continue to grow linearly as you know more and more organizations generate data. So they're going to need data scientists to do stuff with the data. But that's ne not necessarily a good idea either if you just like have data and you don't have a problem you want to solve and just hire people to do stuff with it. You obviously want to achieve some kind of objective, whether that's maximizing something or minimizing something. Um, so to answer the question, uh, there are jobs for data scientists. Don't get me wrong. I, I didn't mean that at all. Um, what I'm saying is the total job pool, if you will, is, uh, is, is, is saturated now and um, it's, it's going to continue to grow, but linearly Whereas I think this field of applied machine learning is going to continue, like that's where there's going to be a lot of action in the space if you want to get into it. And it's, if you know also how to program, I mean, or, or code, uh, yeah, the world's your oyster. Um, thanks to a lot of people saying, um, I'm uh, saying some good stuff here. Uh, so so uh, essentially applied machine learning, uh, uh, you know, a good place to get started. Uh, is on your cloud service provider of choice. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be uh, hosting this through um, Azure at the moment, but you, you can go and find uh, resources on all of these sort of custom services here um, and how you can access these APIs to build applications. And then, uh, then again, of course, you need to, uh, uh, you can hire a full stack developer to help you build the front end if you'd like, if you're that way inclined. And I suggest you do that actually because Full stack dev in its own way is, is is quite a complex field, but you know tie tie that together with these with these solutions or a solution you come up with yourself, and you uh, you know it become it then becomes a very very powerful uh, uh, um, set of skills that you can use to to solve problems. You can go in and solve a lot of problems for people. So um yeah guys uh, I think that's most of the questions answered. Um, Thank you, Nadia, for, for, for hosting me. And um, I guess uh, if you'd like to see me around, uh, we have, we're holding another Sydney machine learning event uh, through the reactor in about two weeks' time. So feel free to tune in then. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>